Pope Francis once again ruminates on the idea of retirement this week, while seeming to criticize his immediate predecessor. Here with in-depth analysis is the editor of Catholic World News, visiting professor at Thomas More College, Philip Lawler. Phil, thanks for being here. I want to begin with the Pope's most recent interview. Uh, he seems to be doing multiples every week. Uh, we've asked the Holy See, by the way, for an interview. I'm awaiting a response. This week, he sat down with Univision, claiming he has no plans to retire, but then went on to say that should he retire, he would, quote, surely not stay in the Vatican or return to Argentina either, because, quote, I am the Bishop of Rome. I would be the Bishop Emeritus of Rome. The reporter says, at the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran? And the Pope responds, that could be to hear confessions at a church. Phil, what do you make of this answer, that he would not stay at the Vatican, given that Benedict made a decision to stay there? Uh, well, I have to, Raymond, I have to say, I think you're inaccurate saying this is his most latest interview. I think there was another one that just came out today. Uh, it, you, oh. you can't tell without a scorecard. But, but uh, to I stand question, corrected. <laughs> and you would probably be again tomorrow. Who knows? But uh, to answer your question directly, it's an odd statement. And I have to say the Pope was probably being prompted by the interviewer. But it's you can't talk about a retired pope without acknowledging the fact that we have a retired pope. So it does look like criticism of Pope Emeritus Benedict, who has stayed in the Vatican, when Pope Francis says he wouldn't stay in the Vatican. But then there's a sort of double whammy there, because he exceeds, he accepts the suggestion that maybe he would go live at the Basilica of St. John Lateran. Well, that is the official church of the Bishop of Rome. And if right. he is living in retirement, he's no longer the Bishop of Rome. He's the former Bishop of Rome. And therefore, it's confusing. He says it's confusing yeah. to have someone at the Vatican. That seems to be a veiled criticism of Pope Benedict. Uh, I say yeah. it would be confusing yeah. to have him at St. John Lateran. Yeah, well, ju just and, and just for the record, as you indicated there, uh, St. John Lateran, it's Vatican territory. So it doesn't matter whether you stayed in the garden or you're out at St. John Lateran, you're still at the Vatican. Uh, he had this to say about having a Pope Emeritus on the grounds at the Vatican City State. The first experience went quite well because he's a holy and discreet man, the Pope says, and he knew how to do it well. But for the future, things should be delineated more or things should be made more explicit. How do you interpret that, Phil? It's a funny thing, and again, it's hard not to see it as at least a subtle criticism of Pope Benedict. He's suggesting he, mm. he Benedict, handled it well. Uh, what, he is, what has he done? He's been almost completely silent since his, re since his retirement. He's been very scrupulous about never getting involved in any current controversies in the church. So that's handling it well. Um, to be honest with you, to be candid, I can't imagine Pope Francis in retirement being quiet about other controversies. In that respect, I do understand what he's saying. He might confuse people as a former pope. In fact, he probably would because he's confusing people now as the current pope. During the interview, Pope Francis was asked about the defense of abortion by President Biden. Uh, Francis stated that he leaves it to Biden's conscience adding, let him talk to his pastor about that incoherence. Your reaction to that, uh, Phil? There seems to be a lot of incoherence coming from the church these days. Just what I was going to say, the, the incoherence in that statement, because he also said that it's a problem when the pastor becomes political. Now, we all know what he means by that, although he doesn't say it outright. He means a criticism of Archbishop Salvatore Corleone of San Francisco, who has told Speaker Pelosi that she cannot receive communion in that archdiocese. And mm -hmm. the Pope yeah. is suggesting that, that uh, he became political in saying that, and therefore he wasn't pastoral. Well, to my mind, right. he right. was making the ultimate pastoral statement. He was telling a member his, of his flock, your soul is in jeopardy. You have to stop doing this. Mm. That's pastoral. That's not political. 
And yeah, it, by the way, it's a curious there's, formulation. There's no, yeah, it, it, there's no shortage of political statements coming out of the Vatican these days, by the way. Hmm. On Wednesday, Pope Francis named three women to the dicastery of bishops. Now, this is the office responsible for evaluating and suggesting new bishops to the Pope. Two are religious sisters, as well as Maria Lia Zervino. Now, she is a member of the Association of Consecrated Virgins, who is also a consultant to the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Phil, what's the Pope trying to accomplish here? And where are the lay men? Good question. We're getting lay women, not lay men, because women want a role in choosing bishops. Well, women and lay women and lay men now have a role in choosing bishops insofar as we can make our voices heard. We can send suggestions to Rome. I've done that. I know at least mm -hmm. one time, actually, my suggestion had some impact. Uh, but particularly to put them on a congregation which was previously made up only of bishops, the idea being that you need the successors of the apostles to choose the successors of the apostles. So putting women in there, well, it gives women a say. Uh, on the other hand, does it raise unrealistic like, expectations of what doors might be open to bishops, uh, I'm sorry, to women next? Mm. Well, you, you raise an interesting point. A, a statement following the announcement uh, was issued by the Women's Ordination Conference. Uh, they said they welcomed Francis's move, but they cautioned that appointing more women to the Vatican Post, quote, cannot alone address the injustices women face in the church. Citing a culture of clerical, a culture of clericalism and sexism, we also note the deep irony that women may now aid in selecting bishops, a role they themselves are prohibited from holding on account of their gender, end quote. Now, the uh, Women's Ordination Council, of course, advocates for ordaining women as deacons, priests, and bishops. What do you make of the timing of that statement, particularly as we find ourselves uh, moving into this synod on synodality, Phil? The, the timing of the statement was predictable uh, because the... Folks at the Women's Ordination Conference are never going to be satisfied with what the Vatican does, short of ordaining women to the priesthood, which Pope John Paul II has already told us is impossible. So whenever the Vatican takes, a, or anyone else in church leadership, takes a step to give women a greater role, the people who want ordination of women are very predictably going to come out and say that's not enough. And that's one reason why I say it concerns me that this sort of thing, uh, this sort of appointment, which looks like tokenism, is going to excite expectations which the church can never meet. Hmm. Phil, the, the Pope met with the leaders of three religious congregations on July 14th. He urged them to take a, quote, zero tolerance approach to sexual abuse. He put it this way, one of the problems we know that often exists is the problem of abuse. Please remember this well, zero tolerance of abuse of minors or disabled people, zero tolerance. I accompany you, you are a sinner, you are a sick person, but I have to protect others. Now, Phil, uh, this seems at odds with the way the Pope personally handled the case of, take for instance, convicted abuser Gustavo Zanchetta. Bishop Zanchetta uh, was found guilty in an Argentinian court. He's now apparently going to live out his days at a monastery under some kind of house arrest. You'll remember the Pope rejected the accusations against Zanchetta initially, going so far as to create a job for him at the Vatican. Um, columnist Marco Tosati writes this week that the same officials who convicted Zanchetta have granted him house arrest, and uh, he's being sheltered, as I mentioned, in a monastery. Your reaction to all of this? Well, you're right. This There is, again, an inconsistency here, because, unfortunately, Bishop Zanchetta is not the only example, although he might be the most egregious one. Uh, examples of Pope Francis protecting bishops who are allies of his, giving them the benefit of the doubt, probably long after they deserve the benefit of the doubt, uh, and causing greater scandal thereby. And 
So you ask yourself, is there a zero tolerance policy across the board? Or is there some special policy for friends of the Pope? Because if it's the latter, then that sort of inconsistency will, of course, inflame passions, uh, and rightly so, mm -hmm. among people who say we should have zero tolerance across the board. Yeah, well, if we're going to have zero tolerance, I think we should have zero tolerance for any abusers, not just abusers of minors and, and disabled people. I mean, what, what about uh, teenagers? What about, uh, gro you know, grown seminarians who are abused? I mean, they're also under under the, the power of an individual. There should be zero tolerance across the board. I don't know why we're carving this out. But anyway, um, last week, the Pontifical Academy for Life issued a book entitled Theological Ethics of Life. Scripture, tradition, practical challenges, where there were arguments made about the church's condemnation of artificial birth control and the application of those norms. Since then, the Academy has received a series of complaints and blowback on social media. Over the last few weeks, the Twitter account of the Pontifical Academy for Life has been responding to these complaints about the new document. In one instance, it warned that, quote, what is dissent today can change. And in another, it admonished someone that he or she should give credit to the dicasteries of the Curia and not to those who, for biased reasons, say no, end quote. Phil, what do you make of the Academy's response to criticism, particularly the warning that what is dissent today can change? I think, to use the expression, they're running it up the flagpole to see who will salute. There's a, a bid here to reopen the discussion of contraception, a discussion that happened in the wake of Vatican II or around the time of Vatican II with the Papal Commission on Birth Control. And that led, of course, to the encyclical by Pope Paul VI, uh, the Humanae Vitae, very controversial, uh, in which he reaffirmed the traditional ban uh, on the use of artificial contraception. Well, it seems that now the Pontifical Academy of Life, of all places, wants to reopen that discussion. And that's why there's the suggestion what was dissent today can be something else tomorrow. Yeah. I say it's particularly ironic that it's coming from the Pontifical Academy for Life because that body was established by Pope John Paul II to promote the pro-life, uh, the culture of life, the culture that is uh, buttressed by the traditional teachings on human sexuality of the Catholic Church. And in the last couple of years, it has been gutted and it has become a voice for a vision very, very far removed from that of the Polish Pope. Sad. Uh, lastly, in a letter to participants at the EU Youth Conference in Prague this week, Pope Francis asked young people to eat less meat in a bid to take care of the environment. He wrote, quote, it is urgent to reduce consumption, not only of fossil fuels, but also of many superfluous things. And also in certain areas of the world, it is convenient to consume less meat. This can also help save the environment. What do you think uh, when you heard this culinary and climate advice from the Holy Father? I couldn't help but notice in the same conversation, he suggest suggested encouraging regenerative agriculture, agriculture that's easier on the environment, you know, uh, ecological agriculture. And, you know, this week we've seen the future of that movement in Sri Lanka, where the government has just been overthrown because they're in crisis, because they can't get enough food. The Pope is not an expert on agriculture, and I think certainly our first priority is to grow enough food so that there are no people hungry. After that, mm -hmm. once that goal is met, then let's talk about uh, environmentally friendly agriculture. But the first, the first goal has to be to feed everyone. And when he talks about eating less meat, you know, there are an awful lot of people in parts of the world who don't get enough meat, who need meat. It's just an odd thing for them to hear the Pope suggesting you should eat less of it. Mm. Phil Lawler, we will leave it there. Thank you for your insight. Uh, as always, you can find Philip's reporting, commentary at catholicculture.org. Thank you, Phil. Thank you.